Welcome to the Super Abundant Life Podcast, where we teach the Bible in a simple, authentic, and practical way so that Christians can skillfully apply the Word of God to create supernatural results in every area of life. This is your host, Olaomi Bridgway. Hello, this is Olaomi and welcome back to another episode of the Super Abundant Life podcast. So I want to talk about something that I believe holds a lot of us Christians back and that is analysis paralysis. And I'm not even talking about analysis paralysis from the point of view of, okay, I I need everything to make sense logically. I'm talking from the point of view of, is it God's will? Is it not God's will? You know how, when you have a desire inside of you, you, there's something you want to do. Um, but you're like, is this something that God wants me to do? Is this a job that God wants me to take? And because there's really not, you know, you don't have that certainty or that clarity in terms of what God wants you to have and to pursue, it literally leaks power. When there's no clarity, power is leaked. You don't go for something with this, you know, if you don't have conviction that it's something that you're supposed to be going after at the first hurdle or even the second or third hurdle, you find yourself sort of regressing and you don't really turn on the power to go for it because you simply don't know it. Like maybe it's on my own, Joe, and then you literally move on. So that's what I want to talk about today that I want, I want to go into the fact that there are certain, you know, there's, there will always be a degree of faith that you need to have regarding anything. And if God lives in us and we know that he does and he's directing our steps, then you feel you have to be bold enough to take certain steps, even when you're thinking, okay, I'm not 100% sure. And it's not easy to do. What I want to share with you today is how to get to that point where you're not allowing this whole, is it God will, God's will, is it not God's will, stop you from reaching out for things in life. Because I've, it's, it's very easy to do, essentially. You can go five, 10 years, one year, 18 months, um, and not really push for the things that are in your heart because you keep feeling, well, if it's not working, maybe it's not really what God wants me to have. And we use that as a cop out, um, to turn away from actually fighting. And on the other hand, there are things that God will not have us have. And that's the truth. It's not everything that you see and you want that is God's best for you. So how do you draw a fine balance between that? How do you still move forward knowing that this might actually not be exactly where God will have me be, right? I'm going to talk about all of that in today's podcast. Now, the episode that I'm going to share with you today is actually a blast from the past. Um, Earlier on in the year, uh, late 2018, going into early 2019, I used to do this Bible study and it is pretty much um, what I've been doing on the podcast. So I would take characters from the Bible and then go deep into the lives of those characters and extract life lessons, which is essentially what the podcast is. But this is more like a Bible study. And what I want to share in, in, in the podcast, as I said, is how to overcome that analysis paralysis where you don't have the confidence to go for the things that are in your heart because you don't really know whether it is what God will have you do or not. Okay. I promise you, you're still going to take, you know, get a lot out of it. And the reason why I actually decided to share this was I had my notes. I have, you know, I planned in advance what I'm going to share leading up to the year 2020. And one of the things I had written down was analysis paralysis. And the Holy Spirit basically reminded me that this, there's a particular teaching that you did that this is going to be right for. So I thought, why reinvent the will? If I've already taught on it, then I should just share it because I I genuinely believe that you will get a lot of it. So I'm going to roll the tape and yes, I, you know, I hope, I hope it blesses you because I listened to it again and I'm like, man, 2020, I'm coming for you, right? (laughs) That's exactly how I felt when I listened to the to the, um, teaching again. So I hope, you know, that is 
what it does for you as well. It gets you off that whole, um, I'm not sure I'm paralyzed because I, you know, I need to be 100% certain that this is what God will have me do before I move forward. No, we're supposed to move forward and we trust and rely on the mercy of God to order our steps. And even when we make mistakes, I say this to people, it is better to move forward and make a mistake and allow God to order your steps and direct you and rely on his mercy than to never do anything. Okay. So are you ready? Okay. So here we go. So welcome again to this week's Bible study. I am going to get started. So this week, what we advertised this week, the topic that we're going to be exploring is when a door refuses to open. So when you have a closed door staring you in the face and the description or the information that I put out regarding this topic is simply this. You know, when you have a goal, you, you have a desire for something or you see something and you think, okay, I want this or I want to achieve this. And then you, everything around you, all the conditions around you seem to be pointing um, in the direction of that thing. Seems like, I mean, this is a good idea. There's nothing really that you can spot around it that seems to um, indicate that this is not the right step to take. Maybe it's in your career, maybe it's in your finances or whatever it is. By observing around you, it looks like a good step to take. But then you begin to take that step and then you come up against what appears to be a very formidable closed door, a door that simply will not open. So you're doing everything you know to do, et cetera, and this door just seems to be shut in your face. Now, there are two ways of looking at this. (laughs) When you think of it in practical, in real terms, you could say, oh, the enemy is trying to steal what is mine, etc. cetera. Um, and, you know, f- how, do you, how do you proceed? Because at that point, you need to know whether actually what's going on. Is this something that certainly God would have me move forward and into and have? Or is this something that God is actually saying you need to change direction? This is not for you. And a lot of times we come to the crossroads, particularly when we don't yet have that conviction that this is what God will have you do. So what do you do? So that's what we're going to be exploring today. When you're in a situation whereby something that you're pursuing just seems out of your reach, you don't quite understand why. When you're at that point, that is what we're going to be addressing. The second thing that I'm also going to be addressing is the whole, is it God's will? Is it not God's will? Um, palava, <laughs> because I find that a lot of us actually will not step forward. We will not move. Why? Because we don't have that assurance, that guarantee that this is what God will have me do. There are some things that are explicitly stated in the Bible where you know that this is God's will and so on. But should I go for this job? All right. It's not necessarily, you can't just read the Bible and, and it says work for this company. God has to open your eyes in the word, in the Bible for you to see that. So for things that are not explicitly stated, um, should I marry this person and all those things? Uh, should I take this step forward? Should I leave my job in order to go into business? All those kind of things where it is not you know, written explicitly, thou shalt do this. Um, a lot of times because of that uncertainty, we may not move forward, all right? We just sort of start and say, well, I don't, I'm not sure if it's God's will. And even if you begin to move forward, because you don't have that conviction inside you, you may not really push as much as you should. Remember, we're talking about when you're faced with a closed door, should you push because you know that this is what God will have you do? Or when you're not sure, you might think, oh, this is God's way of saying, actually, this is not yours. When we don't have that sense of direction and conviction, it can lead us to being double-minded where, you know, you just don't know what to do. And a lot of times people just abandon that goal, all right, whether that was what God intended to do or not. So today's Bible character that we're going to be studying is a man called Abimelech. Now, to give you a bit of a backstory, a bit of a context about who this person is. So Abimelech appeared in Genesis in the Old Testament. And he, I think he appeared, the, not the same person, but I think Abimelech was more of a title or 
um, the name of a father and then, you know, he named his son the same like Abimelech Jr. But there were certainly two Abimelechs that were recorded in scripture in Genesis. One interacted with Abraham. The other one interacted with Isaac, I believe. So the first one uh, is the one I'm going to be focusing on today, Abimelech. Now, in terms of context, he was the king of a town or city or country, I should say, called Jera. So he was the king of that country. And so somewhere in the Canaanite region. So after Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed, God, I don't know, well, the Bible just says that Abraham got up and then he traveled to Jera, which um, Abimelech was king of. So I don't know whether God sent him there. I'm assuming that God did. But basically, the Bible says that Abraham got up and then he traveled to that country and then he settled there. So that's the context um, of this man, Abimelech, that we're going to be talking about today. He was literally the king of the country that Abraham came in one of his journeys to settle it. All right, so let's start. We're going to be reading from Genesis 20, and um, I'm going to be reading from verse 1. Before I go on and I read from verse 1, this let me give you a little bit more of the context. In those days, I'm sure we're all aware of this, that kings expanded their territories through uh, conquest. So they would, they look at, you know, their neighbors, their neighboring towns or neighboring countries or neighboring cities. I think, oh, I like that city. And they would literally go and conquer it, kill everybody and take possession of it. That was how they expanded their territory. That was also how they expanded their families. So a king would see a beautiful woman and say, uh, I, I like this beautiful woman. I want her to be my wife. I want her to be part of the harem, which is basically where they kept all the women and so on. And the women reproduced for them, etc., concubines. And whether the woman was married or not, okay, it was, it was not out of place for the king to say, I want that woman. And they could end up killing the husband just to get her. So that was the context of how it worked back in the day. So it wasn't just about something that was completely unheard of. Even David did it, all right? We all know about the story of Bathsheba. Uh, he saw Bathsheba, saw that she was beautiful, slept with her, she got pregnant, uh, tried to you know, manipulate things because he was a godly man. David was godly. And he knew straight away that what he did was wrong, right? And he tried to make amends, it didn't work, and it ended up killing the woman's husband. But what I'm even saying is, for a lot of those other kings, they were not godly. They didn't fear God. They would just kill the husband, take the woman, and that's the end of the story. Nobody could say anything about it. It was just the way back then. All right, so that's just giving you a bit of a context about this guy, Abimelech. So that was the times that they lived in. So I'm reading from Genesis 20 from verse 1. And it says that Abraham traveled from there, all right, where he was previously, to the, to the Negev and settled down um, in the Kadesh and Shah. While he was camping in Jera, Abraham said of his wife, Sarah, she's my sister. Abraham traveled from there and settled in Gera, right? While it was there, he said, she's my sister. So Abimelech, king of Gera, sent for Sarah and took her. <laughs> this guy did not waste time, all right? Now, the Bible, you know, when we're reading the Bible, that was literally, if I, if I just read what I want to focus on, it says, Abraham, when he got to Gera, right, he said to the people there, she's my sister, she's not my wife. And then the Bible says, so Abimelech, king of Jera, sent for Sarah and took her. <laughs> and that was the end of the story. There was nothing Abraham could do. Abraham could not protest and say, no, 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 you have to do this. This is my sister. I don't want you, my sister to marry you. He could not protest. But to actually get the wisdom from the Bible, you have to be prepared to sit with it and think and actually make that's what meditating on the word is literally sitting down and allowing the holy spirit to extract the wisdom literally from that word that would relate to your own situation or the situation of the people around you okay so i sat and i thought in just two sentences <laughs> somebody showed up somewhere said she's my sister and then the next thing we know is the king spotted her and carried her off so I'm going to try and expand those tiny two sentences so that we can explain it and actually see it in context of our own 
personal lives today, as we live our lives today. Now, the first thing I want to I want to point out is the fact that the, um, Sarah, the Bible records that Sarah was very beautiful. At this time, was she not even 90? She was like 90 or something like that. And she was still stunning. So she was beautiful. And because Abraham knew that, he decided that he was going to tell a half-truth, which is still a lie. She's really his half-sister. Um, his half sister, but obviously the fact that she's his wife takes precedence over that. Okay, so he was he decided to lie because she was beautiful. That's another story. I'm not going to get into the right or wrongs of that. All right, um, I, I, I'm not focusing on Abraham today. Let's just leave that. The fact that he did that, I'm not going to comment on that. But what I want to see straight away is so a beautiful thing comes into Jera's into Abimelech's space. So this beautiful, attractive opportunity, quote unquote, comes into his space, and notice that um, he did make some inquiries. So he didn't just go and say, "That's a beautiful woman. I don't care who she is, whether she's your wife or whatever. I'm going to take her and I'm going to kill you." You know, he made inquiries because basically Abraham was responding right to the inquiries. Who is this woman to you? And he said, she's my sister. So basically everything in his environment, I'm talking about Abimelech now. So he saw a beautiful, attractive opportunity come into his space and he looks around and he checks all the signs in the natural. So he literally asks Abraham, is this woman available? Abraham says yes. And based on that, he made his decision to pursue that beautiful, attractive opportunity. All right. I hope you can see that. So his decision was based entirely on natural um, indications, on what he could see with his eyes, on what he could hear with his ears and so on. All right. It was based purely on that. It had nothing to do with his heart. And the Bible talks about Jesus in Isaiah uh, 11. It says, he does not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor by the hearing of his ears. But he says righteous judgment. So the first thing I wanted to point out, when when you're at a place where is this God's will, is not God's will, is this God's will, is not God's will. Because there's a tendency for a fantasy to begin to look like a God-given dream. You don't want to waste time pursuing a fantasy. And I'm going to explain about the difference between a fantasy and a God-given dream in a minute. Because the thing about fantasies is they, they blow with the wind. All right? So you notice that if you pursue something and then in about two weeks' time, <laughs> number one, the desire is gone. When you hit obstacles, you're like, I beg, you know, something you've already changed direction, something that you're so passionate about that you thought, I really want this. This is what I'm meant to be doing and pursuing. But it fizzles out in a couple of weeks and you may have expended energy. If you're someone that moves straight away based on emotions, you may have expended energy, time, money, etc. told a million people about it. And then the emotions fizzle out and you're, you're left basically with nothing to show for it. So essentially, this is what happened with Abimelech. A beautiful, attractive woman, which are generally for us, an opportunity comes into his space. So he's literally sitting there and he sees something, oh, that looks good, I want it. And he only judged based on natural indications. Abraham said, she's my sister. Now, because she said, she's my sister, Abimelech thought, okay, tick, everything looks good, I'm going to go for it. But we all know that not everything that looks good on the outside is actually good anyway, all right? So the first thing I noticed about this is everything may have looked good for Abimelech, where Sarah was concerned, a beautiful woman, all right, that can become my wife. She's free, she's not attached, so that means I can move forward with this goal and this pursuit, which he did. All right. But first thing I wanted to point out in this is we are not we were not designed to live independent of God. As Christians, we're not supposed to live in our heads. It cannot just be I see something, I want it. Oh, I hear somebody got this. Oh, that looks good. I'm going to immediately go after it. We are meant to be led from the inside out. We're meant to be led from the inside out. So even when you see something in your environment, all right. You have to at least pause 
to check with your heart, all right? To see whether this is something that your heart agrees with. Not just literally because a beautiful and attractive opportunity comes into your environment and you immediately, based on the emotions that are, that are stirred up, decide to go for it. All right. The Bible says in Psalm 37 verse 4, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires and the secret petitions aware of your heart. So the desires, as you walk with God, there will be certain desires that he himself will plant in your heart. Now, if you don't pause to check those desires that they're in alignment with this thing that your eyes, your ears, everything in the natural is telling you to go ahead for, then you could end up expending energy and wasting energy with nothing to show for it at the end of the day. All right. We're not designed to live independent of God. We're designed to follow him and be led from the inside out. So when you get to the point where is it, is it God, is it not God, this is literally how you know. You go into your heart and you check. If, it's, if, it, if it looks too good to be true, it doesn't mean God is not in it. Some might say, oh, if God is in it, then it must be hard. That's not true. <laughs> That's not true. No. All right. Even things that God will not have us do sometimes are difficult. So you cannot judge by natural circumstances. That was what Abimelech does, did. Sorry. That's what Abimelech did. He looked at it and everything seemed to be green light on the outside. But he didn't even pause because the only way he could have known that, Abim that Abraham was lying was if God revealed it to him. He could not have known by the natural because the very man that was like in charge of the custodian of the woman said take her <laughs> so what do you do in that situation all right so the first thing i i wanted to point out today um is that fantasies all right so what's the difference between a fantasy and a god-given dream all right a fantasy you will fade quickly when conditions become unfavorable that is one way. What is one way to be able to distinguish between a fantasy, all right? And a God-given dream will persist despite the toughest obstacles that you face. So what's my first lesson from the life of this man? There is a difference between a fantasy and a God-given dream. One is motivated purely by, what, by wanting what someone else has, and it will soon fade. The other one is a heartfelt desire that you cannot shake off right? So the first lesson is we should be able to pause when a new opportunity, no matter how shiny it looks, when it comes into our environment, no matter how much of a green light, no matter how many people are telling you this is the right opportunity, you're, you're good to go, go for it. You have, as a Christian, you have to have the mentality that I will not live independent of the direction of God. Just a quick pause. I'm not saying spend six months saying this is real or what. And that one too is just as bad. You don't need to spend six months. You can literally just be still, go home, shut everyone out and sit down with God and just check what is going on in your heart. All right. So there's a difference between a fantasy and a God-given dream. One is motivated purely by wanting what someone else has. So you see something that belongs to someone and you want it. All right. Now that in itself, that's, this is why I'm not using something else to qualify this. That in itself is not bad. There's nothing wrong with that. Remember on, you know, in one of my Bible studies, I've talked about how God will display um, wonderful things and miracles in the life of, lives of people in your environment to inspire you to step higher. So that, that in itself does not mean it's a fantasy. But the second way that you will know that it's a fantasy is if there's a quick burst of emotions and then a couple of weeks or whatever down the line, it's fiddle, it fizzled away and you can't even remember what it was again. Or when you hit the first obstacle, that obstacle just knocks the wind out of it and you've forgotten about it. Meanwhile, a God-given dream, a God-given desire, no matter what happens, you will not be able to shake it off. It will grab hold of you. Even in the deepest um, obstacle or whatever it is, even when everything around is telling you, no, 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 this can't happen, that God-given dream will still speak. So this is the first lesson is to be able to pause long enough 
okay, to distinguish between this new opportunity that's coming to your space. Is it a fantasy? Is it purely based on the fact that I just see something and I want it? And if I just give it a little bit of time, it will fade? Or is it a God-given dream that will persist? Okay, so that's the first thing. Let's keep going. Second part, I'm going to keep reading. So Genesis 20 from verse 3. He <laughs> now says, but that night God came to Abimelech in a dream and told him, you're a dead man. <laughs> For that woman you have taken is already married. <laughs> so obviously that was not a goal that Abimelech should have pursued. Remember we talked about the fact that he only made that decision based on the fact that everything he could see, he could hear, he could understand with his mind said, go for it. But there is another layer of wisdom that is, that is superior, far superior to natural wisdom. And that is the wisdom of God. So you need to be able to pause long enough to say, is God in this? Is this natural or supernatural wisdom? So obviously he made a wrong step. But that's not where the story ended. God didn't come and strike him in the, you know, dead in the night or whatever. So the Bible says that God appeared to Abimelech in a dream and said, you're a dead man. <laughs> so basically, <laughs> oh boy, you have got this one completely wrong. Okay. But Abimelech had not slept with Sarah yet. So he said, Lord, will you destroy an innocent nation? Didn't Abraham tell me she's my sister? And she herself said, yes, he's my brother. I acted in complete innocence. My hands are clean. And in the dream, God responded, yes, I know you are innocent. That's why I kept you from sinning against me and why I did not let you touch her. Can you see the mercy of God? When I read that again, I was just completely blown away. And that is why, you know, I, when I started this Bible study, I talked about how, you know, sometimes we are paralyzed by that whole, is it God's will? Is it not God's will? Or is God speaking? And, God, and sometimes God needs to confirm it to you two billion times before you finally take that step. He's like, yes, yes, it's my will. Go forward. All right, move forward. Like he told the um, children of Israel, why are you standing still? standing there, move forward. He told Moses to tell them, move forward. All right. So sometimes we become paralyzed because of this. Is it God's will? Is it not God's will thing? Now I want to free, I want to set you free now once and for all from, you know, using this story from being paralyzed by, is it God's will? Is it not God's will? Yes. All right. We've talked about at least take a step back and pause. All right. However, most people, I think I'm going to be speaking to most people from this point of being paralyzed and not moving forward than the people that are jumping out, okay? There's actually an advantage to just moving forward. And I'll show you here. The thing is, even though Abimelech was in full pursuit of a fantasy, the goal was not his to pursue. The woman was not his. It was She already belonged to someone else. All right. Just because an opportunity for promotion shows up at work does not mean it's your promotion. It might look good. It might make sense. It might be like, oh, but I've been doing this job for a year. I am due for this promotion. God may have appointed somebody else to do that work. If you see what I mean. Okay. So he believed that it was what he was meant to pursue. All right. But even when he got it wrong, the mercy of God still stepped in. I find that mind-blowing, all right? God stepped in and corrected him. In his mercy, basically, God put a stumbling block. So God shut the door. And that's where we now need to be careful. All right, I'll say two things here. Number one, all right, you can move forward. Um, so you can move forward based on the fact that even though everything looks good to me, you can still move forward when you're not sure. Why? Because the mercy of God will catch you. Because I think people are more likely to be paralyzed by fear and never step out because they think, I don't want to get it wrong. I don't want to get it wrong. It's not God's will. Is it God's will? Than to actually jump out. You're more likely, all right? People are more likely to stay stuck than to move forward. What I'm saying to you here from this man's story is it is okay. Even when you're not sure, 
to take a step forward. The Bible says that God, if God would do it for a heathen king, that literally just carried somebody's wife without really investigating, all right? How will he not do it for you that you are led by the Spirit? You that he inhabits, right? So God shut the door. He had mercy on Abimelech and he did not allow him to sleep with Sarah because he got, I'm pretty sure God would have struck him dead if he had done that. Now, this is where it gets a bit, you know. So what am I saying here, right? To free you forever from this whole analysis paralysis <laughs> where you have to, you know, know without a shadow of doubt that this is what God wants me to do, right? It is better to actually step out. Do your due diligence as much as you can, but don't be paralyzed by that. It is better to step out and make a mistake than to be paralyzed by fear and never do anything worthwhile. So that's my second lesson here. Why? Because it is the mercy of God that will catch you. Some people say jump off the roof and then the parachute or whatever it is will appear, right? What we're saying is, look, if you're not sure, but this thing looks good, it's an opportunity that looks good to you, and in your you have checked your motive. Your motive is, I, I want to do better. So, I, for example, I, I mentioned about a promotion that comes into your space. You have checked your motive and your motive is pure. It's because you really want to progress in your career. God may have a different way for that to happen, but the promotion comes into your space. It looks good. It looks attractive. And maybe your line manager said, this is something I want you to go for. Don't just sit there analysis paralysis thinking oh is it god's will is it not god's will all right he will catch you move forward move forward because it is in the process of moving forward that you will actually receive the direction that will say actually this is where i want you to go and that's what happened for abimelech he didn't just you know even though he was completely wrong the mercy of god still showed up and god prevented him so God shut the door so that he never came into harm. You have to be able to trust God enough for that. You have to be able to trust in his mercy enough for that. So if you're someone that just sits down because you want to be absolutely certain, and as a result of that, if you look back to the past, maybe five, ten years of your life, you haven't really done anything significant because fear holds you back. You can literally destroy the hold of that fear by saying the mercy of God is available to me. I know that even before I take a step wrong, the Holy Spirit will show up and he will preserve me. You must be able to trust him to do that for you. So my lesson too is it is actually better from the story of this man to step out and to make a mistake and to fail than to be paralyzed by fear and never do anything significant. All right, I'm going to move on to the third part. And this is from verse seven. So God continued to speak to him in a dream. Now said, now return the woman to her husband and he will pray for you for he is a prophet. Then you will live. But if you don't return her to him, you can be sure that you and all your people will die. Abimelech, so as soon as God finished speaking to him in a dream, all right? Abimelech got up early the next morning and quickly called all his servants together and told them everything that happened. Then he took some gifts, gave them to Abraham, and then returned Sarah to Abraham. Now, the, third, the second lesson that I talked about is dependent on the third because the truth is, when you commit to, when you take a step forward, you have to trust that the mercy of God will catch you and he will prevent you from stepping into something that will harm you, right? But notice this man, Abimelech. As soon as God told him that this is actually not what I want you to do, all right? I want you to go in a different direction. The Bible says immediately, as soon as God showed him that this is a path that looks good, but is going to end in destruction, he was not stubborn. 
all right he didn't allow the fact that oh this woman is so beautiful i don't care he told me that she's his sister i don't care that's what i'm going to hold on to go and do what you like i i have married her she's mine he wasn't stubborn he didn't allow the lure of temporary satisfaction to stop him from obeying god's voice he immediately got up the next morning and he did exactly what God told him to do. He changed direction. Psalm 37 5 says, give God the right to direct your life. As you trust him along the way, you will find that he will pull it off. So that thing that you truly desire, he will take you there and it will be effortless. So what did I learn from Abimelech's life? Num number one, just, you know, the fact that don't be easily swayed by opportunities that look good. Take a pause to check with your heart because you are led from the inside out. The second thing is even when you take that step based on your own limited knowledge, all right, and your motives are pure, you can still trust God to catch you. His mercy will preserve you from the scorching heat. And then the last thing, the last lesson that I've noticed in the life of this man is that the most important quality in your pursuit of any goal, right? This is the most important part, is what I call your malleability in God's hands. You're being able to be malleable, right? Pliable in God's hands. Your ability to be easily influenced by his corrections along the way. So if you want to live like this, if you want to live and not be paralyzed by fear, all right, where you can just, just step out, all right? Because the other side of that is you never do anything because you are never sure if it's God's will or not, and you never step out. That is not the way to live either, all right? But if an idea comes into your space and you have committed it to God and said, I'm not really sure if this is what you would have me do, but it looks like a good idea and I'm not really getting any red flags. I'm going to step out. If it is something that will end in destruction, God will come in and he will preserve you and then he will change your direction by giving you instruction. For that to work, <laughs> you have to be someone that is easily influenced by God. He will tell you, all right? He made sure Abimelech knew. So just rest fully in the fact that God will direct you. God wants to direct you more than you want his direction. He wants to lead you in the right path more than you want to walk in the right path, right? Understand that. God found a way to make sure Abimelech knew. He showed up in a dream, all right? If he had needed to send an angel, he would have done it. If Jesus needed to, whatever it took for him to know that, listen, change direction because this is going to end in death, right? Then you have to be someone that is quick, that is quick to hear the voice of God, right? And to obey. I believe that any major decision, any major life decision that we as Christians take, I believe that at no point can we say, ah, God told me this thing. I believe that with all my heart. Because it's such a God of mercy. How can you see your own child as a parent that is doing something wrong that maybe he's about to run into a road and you see a car coming and you just stand there and you won't say anything? Or, you, or, you know, you just say, uh, hello, come back, come back. No, you will run, you will scream, you will shout, you will do everything you can to get that child's attention. How much more God? We, that we still have issues. <laughs> All right, our love for our children cannot even be compared to how much God loves us. So if God sees us going down the wrong path, there is no way you have to settle it in your heart that God loves me so much that he will get the right direction to me. He will find a way. Now, the issue is particularly with major life decisions, the person to marry, the career to go into and all those things, right? He will find a way to tell you. However, he needs to get that word to you. He will find a way. Now, the key thing is to be someone that listens. Don't, in, don't suppress it. Like Abimelech, Abimelech could have come up with all sorts of arguments to say that, well, I hear what you're saying. However, this woman is so beautiful. I want her at all costs. 
if he had done that, God would have literally stepped back and said, fine, go ahead. And he and his entire nation would have been destroyed. There comes a time in a Christian's life where God has done everything. He has shown you, he has sent his word. He, he know, you know that you know that you know that you know that this is not something God will have me do. But for whatever reason, for pressure on the outside, for the lust of the eyes, the Bible calls it, where the thing looks too good, you just want to go ahead anyway, there are consequences for things like that that could have been avoided. All right? So I'm going to recap from the life of Abimelech three things that I have learned that I'm going to be applying to my own life. The first thing is when a new opportunity comes into your space. And when I say opportunity, it could literally be um, an opportunity that comes as in you're at work and then an opening shows up for a promotion or a new job and you're not sure. Or what I mean as well is you see someone that is doing something amazing and you think, wow, you know, I want that too. That does not, you don't, you know, these are, these are reasons, you know, that you would go for things in the first place. God will not necessarily come and sit down beside you and tell you, uh, and show up in the flesh and tell you, this is what I want you to do. It's by, you know, your desires. So don't discount your desires. However, be patient enough to at least take some time to check your heart because that thing could very easily be a fantasy right? Just because it looks good on the outside does not mean that it actually leads to life. The Bible says there's a way that looks, that seems right to a man, but it actually ends in destruction. So pause long enough to be able to check your heart because God is in your heart. He will lead you from the inside out. And if you're getting red flags, right, you have to be able to turn away and say, no, even though it looks good, I just don't feel comfortable on the inside. I'm not going to move forward with it. So no, pause long enough to at least be able to decipher between a fantasy and a God-given dream. That's the first thing. The second thing is, even when it is a fantasy, even when really you still, you still were not sure, it is better to step out than to be paralyzed by fear. Being paralyzed by fear is never a good thing. So you have tried to check but you are still not sure, right? Move forward. Why? Because the mercy of God will catch you. The mercy of God. God closed the door on Abimelech so that he did not end up in harm's way. He wasn't harmed. God preserved him. And God showed up and made sure that he, he knew exactly what the situation was. And he gave him direction. So the second lesson is it is better to move forward and make mistakes than to sit back and never do anything significant, all right? It is better to move forward and make mistakes than to try and prevent yourself from ever making mistakes. You never move forward. Trust in the mercy of God to preserve you. And the last thing is in pursuit of any goal, so, I, you know, whatever it is, whether it's in career, anything, any life decision, major life decisions, the most important thing is to be malleable, pliable, like clay, all right? Wet clay in God's hands so that when he turns you this way, you will go that way. When he turns you that way, you will go that way. It's being easily influenced by his correction. So even when you step forward and you weren't sure, as soon as God begins to bring it to your attention that no, this actually is not what I want you to do. Change direction. You have to be willing to do that because usually when that happens, it's because if you continue to walk in that path, it may lead to some really bad consequences that God is trying to prevent from coming into your life. So that brings me to the end of my study of the life of Abimelech. And basically this boils down to decision making. If you're trying to make a decision about a life area or a next step or something, these three lessons will help you, you know, just apply those three lessons and it will give you the confidence to be able to move forward knowing that, look, God's got me and also knowing that God wants to get direction to you more than you even want to be directed um, yourself, okay? All right. <laughs>